You may turn in your Bibles this morning to Revelation chapter 1. And I'll ask you by way of introduction, what comes to your mind when you think about Jesus of Nazareth? What images are evoked? What stories are brought to memory? How do you think of Jesus? Let's read the text we will look at at length this morning. Revelation chapter 1, verses 12 through 16. Here is the word of God. Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking with me. And having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the middle of the lampstands, I saw one like a son of man, clothed in a robe reaching to the feet, and girded across his chest with a golden sash. His head and his hair were white like white wool, like snow, and his eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze when it has been made to glow in a furnace, and his voice was like the sound of many waters. In his right hand he held seven stars, and out of his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, and his face was like the sun shining in its strength. This is the glory of the risen Christ. As we look at this passage, what immediately comes to my mind is the contrast seen between this vision and what we are perhaps more familiar with when we think about Jesus. We think often of the humility of the incarnate Christ, as we should. He came humble, meek, gentle, patient, lowly. He was the object of scorn in his own hometown. We read this from Luke's account. They got up and drove him out of the city and led him to the brow of the hill on which their city had been built in order to throw him down the cliff. He was the target of mockery for the soldiers who carried out his execution. Listen to the words of Matthew in Matthew 27. The soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the praetorium and they gathered the whole Roman cohort around him They stripped him, and they put a scarlet robe on him. And after twisting together a crown of thorns, they put it on his head. They put a reed in his right hand, and they knelt down before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. They spat on him. They took the reed and began to beat him on the head. After they had mocked him, they took the scarlet robe off and put his own garments back on him and led him away to crucify him. We think of Jesus in the upper room the night he was betrayed. With a towel around his waist and a wash basin on the floor, cleaning the dirty feet of 12 men who were not particularly humble one of whom, in fact, would betray him. In the earthly ministry of Jesus, there were, of course, glimpses of glory. The disciples would say, what kind of man is this? When he stilled the wind and the waves with a word. The demons knew who he was and begged not to be punished before the time. In Matthew 17, we read of the transfiguration with Peter, James, and John up on the mountaintop and the voice of the Father sending his approval, saying, listen to my son. And Jesus there was uncloaked, as it were, the curtain drawn back, the veil removed for a short time, and radiant glory beaming forth from him. The same John who wrote the Revelation experienced that moment. We saw in Jesus' earthly ministry his power over nature, his command over the spirit realm, his ability to expose people's secret thoughts, his otherworldly compassion, his heavenly wisdom, his authoritative teaching, his sinless life, his father's public endorsements, and his love to the uttermost 
of those who followed him. All of these pointed to his true and glorious nature. But it was all cloaked in his humanity. He hungered and thirsted. He became weary. He faced temptations. He succumbed to death. To look at Jesus of Nazareth was to see a man. And by external appearances, an ordinary looking man. The words of Isaiah the prophet say this, he grew up like a tender shoot, like a root out of parched ground. He has no stately form or majesty that we should look upon him, no appearance that we should be attracted to him. He was despised and forsaken of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and like one from whom men hide their face, he was despised, and we did not esteem him. In Philippians 2, we read about the glory of Christ in his humiliation. This is bound up in the very character of God to be humble. Listen to Paul in Philippians 2. Christ Jesus existed in the form of God and did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself, taking on the form of a slave, being made in the likeness of men, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. For this reason, God highly exalted him and gave him the name which is above every name. In other words, Jesus in his earthly ministry, because he is God, expressed humility taking on the form of a slave in the appearance of man. And because he was humble, he is highly exalted. It doesn't take much for a worm to be humble. We're worms. We presume that we're humble when we earthworms stoop to the level of the other worms in the dirt. But God displayed an immeasurable humility when he became man and dwelt among us. He was glory incognito, glory veiled, glory covered. Think about all that Jesus suffered. He suffered as the prophet Isaiah predicted he would, Isaiah 53, 7. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb led to slaughter, like a sheep silent before its shearers, he did not open his mouth. Think back to that upper room. Consider Jesus' prayer there in John 17 and verse 5. Father, Glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. And Jesus goes on to pray that his disciples would get to experience the glory of Christ. That they would get to see him in his glory, in his exaltation, not merely in his humiliation. Jesus' own prayer resonates with God's own heart that God's intrinsic glory dispensed means infinite joy for those who are qualified to enjoy it. In the passage before us this morning, we see Jesus, not the glory of Christ smothered in humbled human flesh, but his glory revealed as the eternal God-man in heaven as he truly is. To make our way through this passage, we'll break this up into 10 features. We will see here this morning 10 features of the risen Christ. And these are revealed so that we might have courage and purity to maintain faithful witness until he comes. We'll see this more in chapters 2 and 3 where this vision is unfolded in specific messages to the seven churches. And remember by application, these words are for all who will hear. By application, these words are for us. We need to have courage as faithful witnesses in this world. We must maintain fidelity of, to Christ or purity of life to maintain faithful witness in this world. And so this vision of the exalted and glorified Christ is a help unto that end. We need to have a bigger view of Jesus. We see, first of all, Jesus' serious presence 
Back in verse 10, John said he was in the spirit in the day of the Lord. He heard behind him a loud voice like the sound of a trumpet. So this piercing, authoritative, clear, loud, articulate voice tells John to write. In verse 12, then I turned to see the voice. That's an interesting turn of phrase, isn't it? You hear a voice, I turn to see the voice. You turn to see what is projecting the voice. And having turned, verse 12, I saw seven golden lampstands. Did, did the trumpet sound come from the lampstands? <laughs> no, we will find out as this passage progresses, the, the sound of the voice was the one walking amongst the lampstands. But it's interesting that even here in this great vision of Christ, there is waiting, anticipation. I want to see the voice. And I turned, and there's lampstands. God wanted John to see something else. Still, there's something in that, even, even the way we wait for Christ now. We're told he's coming. He is described for us even in this passage, and yet we, we don't yet get to see him in the ways that our hearts will be thrilled and terrified altogether. In one sense, this is just a pathetic sermon. There is no way to convey with human words what we will experience in the moments when we first lay eyes on the risen, glorified Christ. Words can't carry it. So even in this verse, we have to wait a little bit longer. What are these seven lampstands? This evokes Old Testament imagery. There was a, a lampstand for the tabernacle. It's described in Exodus 25. And that, that lampstand had seven branches to it. It was one lampstand with seven branches. And the lampstand held the lamps which gave the light in the tabernacle. And they were emblems of God's presence. They became emblems of the Holy Spirit's activity and God's dwelling in the midst of his people and the light of truth. And there are a series of Old Testament texts that evokes that imagery. When you come to Zechariah chapter 4, verse 2, it is an explicit reference to the work of the Spirit uh, where the, the seven-branched uh, lampstand is there in the temple imagery. The presence of God, the work of the Spirit, light emanating. But this Old Testament lampstand was one lampstand with seven branches. Notice here in verse 12 of Revelation 1, something different is on display. John says, I turned and I saw seven golden lampstands. What are they? What do these lampstands symbolize? Well, look down at verse 20, we get a very clear explanation. The seven lampstands are the seven churches. We've already been introduced to the seven churches. Uh, those seven churches we looked at last week arranged in a circular fashion along the circular road in the Roman province of Asia Minor. Ephesus to Laodicea in a circle. Seven historic churches in a real time, in a real place in the first century. And these lampstands in this vision are emblems of those churches. Seven separate lampstands, not one. And Christ walking among them. Christ in the middle of them, as we will see. What's interesting here is these churches are separate, independent lampstands. Uh, that's in keeping with the New Testament mission of dispersed witnesses. In the Old Testament, the mission of Israel was to be holy in the land, and Yahweh dwelt in their midst, and the nations were to come and see Yahweh in their midst. They're a weird people, and they serve and worship the only true God. In the New Testament mission, something has changed where now the, the witnesses are dispersed to the ends of the earth. No central location, no temple. In fact, the churches are temples of the Holy Spirit, and the individual believer is a temple of the Holy Spirit, and believers and churches are scattered to the ends of the earth as witnesses of the gospel. And this imagery is important for a church. The lampstand is not the lamp, it's not the light. It's a platform for the light. The lampstand would hold the oil lamp which gave the light. So the church isn't the message. The organization isn't the thing. Christ is the light. The gospel is his message of life and light and truth in Christ. And these lampstands are arranged in a circular pattern like the seven churches of the Roman province of Asia. 
and Christ is said to be in the middle of them. He could not have stood in the middle of a seven-branched lampstand from the Old Testament tabernacle. This is Christ here present with his churches. Now look down at Revelation 2.2. 2. Jesus begins the letter to Ephesus by saying, I know. Verse 1 says, he is the one who walks among the seven golden lampstands. Jesus walking amongst the churches, his serious presence amongst the churches means that he knows. What does Jesus know? Jesus knows what goes on in the lives of his people. Jesus knows what goes on in the churches. Jesus has a vested interest in these fledgling bodies of believers scattered throughout the world and persecuted, maligned sometimes in trouble externally, sometimes in trouble internally, and Jesus knows. Jesus has promised his special presence. We know that Jesus is physically located in his human body, in his glorified state, at the right hand of the Father, making intercession for believers. And we also know that Jesus is located everywhere, every when. There is nowhere Jesus isn't in his deity and his omnipresence. And so Jesus can promise special presence in things like the Great Commission. Scatter to the ends of the earth, make disciples, teach them to observe all that I've commanded you, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and I am with you. Jesus is with his scattered churches in the Great Commission. And Matthew 18 says, where two or three are gathered, there am I with you. What is that context? That is the context of church discipline. When the church seeks to take seriously sin and its threat to precious believers in its midst and has to go through that process, Jesus says, I am with you in that process. Jesus has promised his special presence with the churches. And this presence of Jesus is serious. It means that true churches are not human institutions. They're not terrestrial organizations. It's not as if humans just get together, come up with a good idea, make a church, and then do churchy stuff all on this horizontal plane. The presence of Christ is serious accountability for the church. The presence of Christ is serious comfort as we go about heavenly business in a hostile world. The presence of Christ for the churches means strength and encouragement. The presence of Christ is serious accountability as we go about Christ's business in his church. He assesses and he scrutinizes. He removes lampstands from their place. Chapter 2, verse 5, Jesus says, I will remove your lampstand out of its place unless you repent. He says that to the doctrinally sound church at Ephesus. When they cease to be faithful platforms for the light, they don't get to be a church anymore by Jesus' definition. That is Jesus' serious presence. A second feature we see in this passage is Jesus commissioned humanity. Look at verse 13. I saw in the middle of the lampstands one like a son of man. This is a direct reference to the book of Daniel we studied last year. Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 and 14 says this, I kept looking in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, one like a son of man was coming. The exact same phrase. And he came up to the ancient of days and was presented before him. And to that son of man was given dominion, glory, and a kingdom that all the people's nations and men of every language might serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which will not pass away, and his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. What do we see in this phrase? Well, this is clearly a reference to Jesus as Messiah, Jesus as the son of man, Jesus as the coming king who takes the dominion and the kingdom and the glory given to him by God Almighty, the ancient of days, the heavenly father, who gives all of this dominion and glory to his beloved son so that he will reign on the earth and so that all the nations will serve him. And in this title, son of man, is emphasized Jesus' humanity. It will be a man, a descendant of David, a descendant of Adam, 
who will reign on the earth. Not just any man, of course. In the court of the Ancient of Days, who is God the Father, this Son of Man was given dominion, glory, and a kingdom so that he would be Lord over the nations of the earth. And and while the Son of Man was Jesus' favorite self-designation, he called himself the Son of Man some 80 times in the Gospel accounts, more than any other title he called himself, It emphasizes his humanity so that it's a real humanity, not a figment or a phantom, but really fully human. This title also presupposes his divinity because he is called in the Gospels the Son of Man. Not just a Son of Man, like all of us may be, but the Son of Man, a a distinctly unique kind of human, one who preexisted. One who is a man, but yet is also fully God. The only, the unique one. The only person in all of existence who is actually, simultaneously, 100% deity and 100% humanity. Next we see in this vision, Jesus' regal uh, dignity, his regal dignity. That is, he is like a royal one. He is like a king here. Notice he is clothed in a robe, reaching to the feet, girded across his chest with a golden sash. He has, first of all, a long robe reaching to the feet. This is a, a word used to describe the long garments worn by kings, by the high priest in the Old Testament. And he is said to have here, the New American Standard translate this, uh, girded across his chest with a golden sash. Sash makes it sound flexible, like some sort of woven garment. Uh, truly here, this is a solid metal piece. It is a solid gold girdle, if you will, worn high up around the rib cage. And the idea behind this piece was one of royalty, dignity, and majesty. And this is a far different picture of Christ than we have, say, of the upper room when he is not wrapped in royal garb, but wrapped in a towel to wash the feet of his disciples. A different picture of Christ than we have when he is before the Roman soldiers, draped with a borrowed royal robe for mockery, or when he is on the cross, stripped naked, bloodied, undignified, weak, a shame hanging between heaven and earth. There on the cross, he was a public display of the power of Rome and an object of mockery and scorn. He was a threat to the unbelief of Israel and so was the object of shame and scandal and a curse. But as a substitute payment for our sin, hanging between heaven and earth, he was the object of holy justice. The humiliation of Christ seen most awfully in his sham trial and in his excruciating murder, is our only hope of life. To see the glorified Christ and then to think back on the humiliated Christ ought to move us to think about the depths of our sinfulness. How awful must our condition be if the only solution, if the only way forgiveness can happen, if the only way we have hope of eternal life is if God leaves all of his glory that he is due and comes down in humiliation and himself takes on the infinite payment that his justice is due. Friends, there is no other solution to sin. You think for one moment that you can work your way out of God's laws you have broken. And then you say, Christ died for nothing. If you think for one moment that human religion can merit you some standing before God, what a folly. The only hope, demonstrated by the fact that Jesus came and went to the cross, the only hope is that our sins would be transferred to his account and his righteousness transferred to our account by the free grace of God. Here in the revelation of the glory of the resurrected Christ, we see a different picture than the shame and indignity of his humiliation on a cross. We see a royal figure before whom every knee will bow, clothed in royal dignity. The fourth feature is Jesus' eternal deity. Notice verse 14. His head and his hair were white, like white wool, like snow. 
This again is a reference to Daniel chapter seven. This vision is heavily dependent on Daniel seven and Daniel 10. Daniel writes there in Daniel seven verse nine, I kept looking until thrones were set up and the ancient of days took his seat. His vesture was like white snow and the hair of his head like pure wool. His throne was ablaze with flames. Its wheels were a burning fire. This is a picture of God the Father in Daniel 7, 9. But here in Revelation, the attributes of the Father are transferred to Christ. And that might be jarring for a moment. Wait, Daniel 7, 9, the Ancient of Days with white hair. Isn't that God the Father? Here, the one with white hair is the Son. Does that make sense? Well, this is normal in our Bibles. In fact, the transfer of attributes from Yahweh or from God the Father properly over to Jesus Christ is a normal feature of your Bible. It shows up everywhere. The names of God are given to Christ. The the characteristics of God are given to Christ. The acts of God are given to Christ. In fact, if you want a rich display of those, read Isaiah 40 to 48, those nine chapters where God is the only Savior. Jesus is the Savior. God stretched out the heavens by himself and placed all the stars. Jesus did that. God created everything out of nothing. Jesus created everything that exists. These patterns are normal in the New Testament. In fact, in the book of Revelation, Jesus is called the living one, a reference to the Old Testament title for God the Father, the living God. In chapter 2, verse 8, Jesus is called the first and the last. That is a direct quote from Isaiah 41 and 44, which are attributed to Yahweh. And in Revelation 5, 12, we read, Worthy is the Lamb to receive power and riches and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And Isaiah 42 and 48 both declare only God gets the glory. And all of this ascribed to Christ. We shouldn't be surprised here that the picture, the portrayal of the Father's attributes are seen here of the Son as well. And in Daniel, the white hair seems to be a picture of the wisdom and honor that accompany age. We've sort of lost the reverence for wisdom and age in our day. And that wasn't lost on the ancients. And the ancient of days with white hair is the one who is eternal who has always existed and is infinite in his wisdom, worthy of infinite reverence. There is one other place in scripture where white wool and white snow are combined in one place, that's Isaiah 118, and it talks there about the forgiveness of sin. When believers get their sins forgiven, they will be white as snow and white as wool. Some have suggested that the the white hair here is a reference to sinlessness. But I think the Son of Man is actually being portrayed with the same white head of hair that the Ancient of Days is portrayed in Daniel 7, 9 to convey the reality that Jesus shares with his Father the eternality that belongs to God alone. In other words, the second person of the Trinity has always existed in eternity past. This is what Micah 5, 2 says. Speaking of Jesus' birth, he says, his goings are from long ago from the days of eternity. Nobody else is like that. Nobody gets born who has already lived forever. But that is true of the Son. Fifthly, we see Jesus penetrating perception. His eyes, verse 14, were like a flame of fire. This depicts Jesus' omniscience. His penetrating, scrutinizing gaze. He sees everything. He knows everything. He pays attention to everything. The language here comes out of Daniel 10. I lifted my eyes and looked, and behold, there was a certain man dressed in linen whose waist was girded with a belt of pure gold of Uphaz. His body also was like beryl. His face had the appearance of lightning. His eyes were like flaming torches. His arms and feet like the gleam of polished bronze and the sound of his words like the sound of a tumult. A near identical description in Daniel 10 to what we read in Revelation 1, which is why I believe it was Jesus himself who appeared to Daniel in that vision in chapter 10. Follow the eyes of Jesus for a few moments with me in his earthly ministry. What did Jesus see with those eyes? He could see hard hearts. Mark 3, 5 says, after looking around at them with anger, grieved at their hardness of heart. See, Jesus could see through the externals. We can be whitewashed tombs 
and us humans can think everything's good on the outside, Jesus penetrates. He knows what goes on in the heart. He could see true spiritual condition, Mark 3.34. Looking about at those who were sitting around him, he said, behold, my mother and my brothers. Jesus knew who spiritually was alive and who was not, who truly belonged to him. His eyes looked with compassion upon a woman suffering from physical bleeding and suffering as a social outcast in Mark 5. He looked around to see the woman who had done this. She had reached out and said, if I just touch his cloak, I'll be healed. And power went out from him. Jesus was compassionate with her. He could see idols of the heart, Mark 10, 21. Looking at the man, Jesus felt a love for him and said to him, One thing you lack, go and sell all you possess and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. To a man who externally by all appearances had kept the commandments. And this guy's living a straight life, an obedient life. And Jesus saw through to his heart idols. He loved riches. What else could Jesus see? He could see wrong thinking in his disciples. Mark 10, 23. Jesus, looking around, said to his disciples, how hard it will be for those who are wealthy to enter the kingdom of God. What does his disciples think? Hey, if somebody's rich, he's blessed by God. God's evidently endorsing his life. He's showing favor. That's why he has all that money, because he's doing things right on the inside. Jesus saw where their thinking was wrong. Saw right through them. He could see through empty religion, Mark 11, 11. Jesus entered Jerusalem, came into the temple, and after looking around at everything, he left. He would come back and overturn the tables. He could see Peter's denial before it happened. Luke twenty two sixty one. 61. The Lord turned and looked at Peter. Peter remembered the word of the Lord, how he had told him, before a rooster crows today, you'll deny me three times. And now in this vision of the glorified Christ, his eyes are said to be as flames of fire. Reminds us of Hebrews 4.13, all things are laid bare before him with whom we have to do. His fiery gaze could be one of righteous anger, of indignation, of intense compassion, of love, and of judgment. Sixth, we see Jesus' irresistible strength. This is verse 15. His feet were like burnished bronze when it has been made to glow in a furnace. The burnished bronze here, it's a word that only shows up two times here in the book of Revelation, and then so far people haven't been able to find this word in any other extant Greek literature. So there's some debate about what it means. It seems to be some sort of bright alloyed precious metal, a brass or a bronze, that is still glowing white hot out of the furnace. I think this is an intentional contrast to Daniel chapter two. If you remember Daniel two, that was Nebuchadnezzar's dream and the statue with the four empires and the four plus one empires. Descending from soft, precious metals to harder materials down to the bottom legs, which were mixed iron and clay. And that mixed iron-clay conglomeration is Rome 2.0, the the revived Roman Empire. And remember, it is at the feet where the stone cut out without hands from that heavenly mountain crashes down to the earth and strikes at the feet. That means Jesus returns at Rome 2.0 and then obliterates the statue to powder where the wind blows it away to nothing like chaff. In contrast to those legs of iron, partly of iron, partly of clay, or feet partly of iron, partly of clay, the kingdom of Christ, when it comes, will be indomitable, unstoppable, irresistible, in its strength. It will not be divided, it will not be mixed, it will not be crumbly. The statue of human empires from Daniel 2 will be obliterated, smashed, and scattered to the winds, but Jesus is pictured here as strong at the feet, invulnerable. His feet are strong as precious metal that will never topple. His kingdom will never be threatened or dislodged. There is no force that can withstand his reign when it comes to the earth. This also picks up the language of Daniel 10.6, his arms and his feet like the gleam of polished bronze. And you think about this 
hard metal coming right out of the fiery furnace. You wouldn't want to be under the foot. This is serious business to go against Christ when he comes in fiery judgment and irresistible strength. A seventh feature of this vision is found in verse 15. It is Jesus' powerful voice. His voice was like the sound of many waters. We read in verse 10 that this voice was like a trumpet, clear, penetrating, authoritative. Here in verse 15, his voice is said to be like the sound of many waters. The language also comes from Daniel 10.6, the sound of his words like the sound of a tumult. A number of summers ago, our family was in a snowstorm in June in Yellowstone National Park. And when the snow falls, it sort of quiets everything. It, it muffles everything. It, it gets peaceful. And in this snowstorm, we walked down a trail to Yellowstone Falls. And, and we came around the corner, and we were stunned by the sound. We expected to see a beautiful waterfall. What we heard was deafening, overwhelming, heart pounding. You sort of come up to the edge of the railing and you can hear the deep decibel pounding of the crack of water on the base of the falls. And it just gets you here. It's humbling and thrilling simultaneously. I've been on the north shore of Oahu during a big swell where you hear the thunderous crack of a massive wave collapsing onto the foamy surfaces of the water, followed by the tumbling, deafening rush of ocean towards the shore. The sound echoes off the rocks, and you can't speak over it. You can't have a conversation when that's happening, and you feel really small. John was exiled on the Isle of Patmos, the barren rock in the middle of the sea. He would have been an audience to such sounds at his prison home. And here in this vision, the voice of the glorified Christ drowns out all other sounds. The one who went to the cross without a word is here portrayed as the one whose powerful voice will silence all others. And then we see in verse 16, Jesus' protective ownership. Look down. In his right hand, he held seven stars. John sees Jesus holding seven stars in his right hand. Right hand is the right hand of power and authority. To hold a star, if you can imagine that for a moment, would indicate size and strength, power, authority, and ownership. Colossians 1.15 makes it clear that Jesus holds all the stars of the universe. But here John names seven what are these seven stars? We'll look down at verse 20. We get the interpretation right here in the passage. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. Who are these angels of the seven churches? Well, stay tuned. We'll find out who they are and what is their role in the passages to come. What is pictured here by Jesus holding them? This is emblematic of Jesus' relationship to the churches. These churches are little. They're, they're puny compared to the Roman Empire. They're small and, and isolated and persecuted in a dark world, and they are to him precious. They are to be protected. They belong to him. These are the bearers of the gospel. They are light in the darkness of a lost, corrupt, troubled, and rebellious world. These churches, dispersed to the ends of the earth, hold out the light of Christ to the world. The light of Christ is the world's only hope. The light of Christ is what the world needs, and yet the light of Christ is a threat to the world's darkness and rebellion. Think about what it means to be a church. The, the life givers become the enemies of the dead and dying. And it shouldn't be so. The light bearers become the enemy to the darkness. And it should not be so. For gospel proclaiming, persecuted churches to be held in the right hand of Jesus is a guarantee of his powerful protection over his own witnesses. 
The churches are precious to him. They are protected by him. He will complete his mission through them, and the darkness will not overcome. Ninth, we see Jesus' imminent victory. It's in verse 16. Out of his mouth came a sharp, two-edged sword. There are a number of swords in your Bible. If you're a sword aficionado, you would have a really fun time in a Greek dictionary looking up all the words used for swords. Make some for yourself at home, perhaps. This sword is the Thracian sword. It's a large, broad sword. The typical Roman sword of the soldier was a short, tongue-shaped blade used to thrust and to stab. Uh, The Romans in their hand fighting were looking for the mortal blow. They didn't want to slash and make a guy bleed. They wanted to get right to the heart. But this Thracian blade was a different weapon altogether. Sometimes it was called a spear, it was so long. It is long and heavy. I found a first century BC sword of this type for sale, about $5,000. You can get an old iron Thracian sword. It's four foot long and very heavy. The Thracian sword could split shields and pierce helmets. It had a curved or angled end to it that could rip armor away from the body. It was said to be a very deadly weapon. Normally sharp on only one edge, this Thracian sword is sharp on both sides, and it is said here to proceed from the mouth of Christ. This seems like a strange picture. Sword coming out of the mouth. This actually was a very common metaphor in ancient times. In fact, that Roman short sword was compared to a tongue. And in the Old Testament, the word of God was compared to a sword. You may think also of Hebrews 4.12. The word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, able to pierce. It gets between joints and marrow or thoughts and intentions of the hearts. If such separations were even possible, the word of God gets down there with surgical precision, like a sharp two-edged sword. The words of a man or the words of God compared to swords was common in New Testament times. It becomes significant here because of what we read of Christ in Revelation 19.15. You can turn ahead to this final scene when Christ returns. And we read this, this is at Messiah's return to the earth. From his mouth comes a sharp sword, so that with it he may strike down the nations. And he will rule them with a rod of iron, and he treads the winepress of the fierce wrath of God, the Almighty. How will Jesus lay waste to the armies that will oppose him when he comes to the earth? By the sword of his mouth. By a word from him. When you read Revelation 19 or any of the depictions of the battle of Armageddon, there there is no climactic back and forth, victory or defeat hanging in the balance. Again, this, this battle probably would not make a great long war movie. But we have here sure victory, a singular victory, total peace by the elimination of any of every enemy at one stroke. By the word of Christ. And think about what the word of Jesus has done already. At a word, demons were put to flight. At a word, storms hushed. At a word from Jesus, death reversed. By the word of Jesus, the universe was spoken into existence. By the word of his power, Colossians 1.15, are upheld every subatomic particle in every constellation. On the macro and the micro, nothing stands and holds together apart from the active word of Christ. And so by the sword of his mouth, every enemy will be brought to justice. Previewed here in the revelation of Christ in Revelation 1, to let us know that Jesus is ready His victory is imminent. He must only say the word and it is done. And we find finally in verse 16, Jesus' radiant splendor. His face was like the sun shining in its strength. We see in Daniel 10.6 the similar language. His face had the appearance of lightning. I don't know if you've ever seen lightning up close. 
blinding white light. Here in Revelation 1.16, his face is said to shine like the sun in its strength. And you know this, we can't just look at the sun. I tried to get some data on the sun this week, tried to figure out, okay, how many lumens is the sun? And the answer was far more complicated than I care to admit. I, I got lost, and I actually have no answer for you. I like numbers and astronomy, and, and every recreational astronomer would have seen through my folly and my stupidity, so I'm not even going to try to tell you how bright the sun is. It's really bright. The glory of Jesus here is said to be like the sun shining in its strength. This is the glory of unapproachable light. We would shield ourselves, hide ourselves, fall down as dead. Listen, Jesus had this glory before the world was. Peter, James, and John caught a glimpse of this glory on the mountain in Matthew 17. This is the glory that belongs to Jesus as God. John Owen makes the remark that a sun under eclipse loses nothing of its intrinsic glory. It's just hidden by the moon. Jesus never lost anything of his intrinsic glory when he was here the first time. But it was eclipsed by his humiliation in the incarnation. Jesus really is as we see in Revelation 1. We need to have a bigger view of Jesus. Friends, have you seen Jesus this way? Have you reflected on this text? Does, does this shape the way you view Christ? Away with the silly 19th century liberal sweet gentle Jesus view. Jesus would never judge. They forget that when Jesus was here the first time, he said, I have come to cast fire on the earth and how I wish it were already kindled. This is holy God who will have his vindication. He will be just. He sees the secrets of every human heart and he will hold everyone to account. He will return and vindicate his own name in the glory of the triune God and he will reign on the earth and you better be on the right side. Why is John given this vision? We might ask, why do we need this vision? Uh, won't, won't we see that soon enough? Oh, we need to see Christ this way. We need to have courage when we feel like we're alone. You may be alone for Christ in your home, in your marriage, among your siblings. You may be alone for Christ in your workplace, in your classroom, maybe in your neighborhood. You need this vision of Christ. He said, I will be with you. He has promised his presence and his protection. And we, re, we need to revisit this glorious resurrected Christ for courage. We also need this vision of Christ for purity. A lampstand doesn't get to be a lampstand without courage and purity. Without bold witness and fidelity of life. Listen, to, to see Christ in this way, you, you just think, if, if you had come into the presence of God like this, if you were Isaiah and Isaiah 6, you would say, I am ruined, I am a dead man. I'm a sinner with unclean lips. And as we'll see next week, John does the very same thing when he sees the glorified Christ. When we see him in person, we will be like him for we shall see him as he is. That is the great purifying reality of glory. And I'm convinced if we pre-visit that scene, it will have a purifying effect. How, how do we leave this scene and go embrace the things that Jesus hates? We have to come back here. We need this vision. We need this vision for courage, 
We need this vision for purity that we might be faithful witnesses. We need a big view of Jesus. He is scarier than we know. He also loves us more deeply than we can fathom. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, it's good for us to be here. Maybe we could build tents and stay for a while. We'll sing together with our hearts enriched, perhaps our thoughts tattooed with this vision of you, exalted, glorified. How it stirs our hearts to think of you maligned, mocked, spit upon, beaten. For those who hated you to put a sign over your cross, King of the Jews, they were so right and so wrong. Lord, we long to worship you as you are due. And we pray that even as we sing words now, our feeble voices and the feeble platforms of our lives would be a pleasing aroma to you until you make us perfect and we are truly in your blindingly glorious presence, sinless, blameless, with great joy. Come, Lord Jesus.